Hello, and thanks for joining us online today. To get the most out of your experience, you can download the Grace Church app and tap on the Sunday morning tab. You'll be able to take notes, access the Bible, and fill out a response card. If you'd like to check out other messages from other Sundays, you can find those there as well. It's also a great way to share Grace Church with others. Well, this online experience is made possible through the generosity of people just like you at Grace Church. And if you'd like to contribute to what God is doing here, you can also do that in the app at WorcesterGrace.org or simply by texting Grace Church Woo to 77977. Christmas. It's the most wonderful time of the year, filled with moments that create memories. We often paint a picture in our minds of what Christmas is. Christmas cards, parties, meals, and of course, presents. The older we get, the more Christmas becomes all about what we think it should be. This year, let's look for more than the magic and wonder around us. This year, let's celebrate a Not About Me Christmas. Well, good morning, and Merry Christmas. I'm so glad that you have chosen to join us uh, this Christmas season here at Grace Church. I'm glad you're here. Well, let me tell you, I asked and you answered. A, a week ago or so, uh, on Facebook, I put a little thing out there and I said, hey, if you could describe the perfect Christmas... In one word, one thought, one sentence, or one picture, what would it be? And man, did you respond. I got over 60 different comments and things. So let's see if maybe one of these things would match what you think would help make a perfect Christmas. And so to do that, when I share something and you're like, yes, that has to be a part of Christmas for it to be perfect, I want to hear some feedback. So I'm like cheering, okay? Are you up for that today since it's cold outside? You're up for cheering a little bit? Okay, four of you. That's great. How about the rest of you? Are you up for it? Yeah? Okay, good. Okay, so for the first person said, in order to have a perfect Christmas, they got to have snow, right? Anybody have to have snow? Yeah. Yeah, boo. Anyway, uh, we're going to get some this week. No, it's beautiful at Christmas and also Easter sometimes in Ohio. But anyway, one person said, man, I like snow. A lot of snow. 17 degrees, cold air, and snow. Lots of snow. I was like, wow, I get it. So you like snow, right? For that person you got to have snow to make a perfect Christmas. Or, or how about this one? How about the perfect Christmas music, right? Anybody like, you got to have Christmas music. Okay, four people again. Wow, you people, bah humbug in the crowd today. But anyway, uh, some people have to have the perfect music. Uh, one person even got very specific and said, Michael Buble Christmas, right? Yeah, no, no. Don't. Don't judge that person either. Just because I prefer the Ohio State Marching Band Christmas music doesn't mean that you have to. We can all have our own little preferences. But sometimes music is required for it to have the perfect Christmas, right? Or, or how about a Christmas tree, right? How many people are real tree fans? Let me hear it. Yeah? Yeah, you're crazy. Fake tree fans? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm like the pre-lit fan until I got my tree out this year and they were all burned out. But anyway, uh, one person, our drummer in our band, shared his perfect Christmas tree, and it was a drum set just stacked on top of one. And I thought, hey, now that's pretty good and a little scary because it's Pinteresty. What's our drummer doing on Pinterest? But anyway, uh, a tree makes it kind of perfect, right? Or then they kind of turned and some people shared some serious things, things that they're kind of weighing on them, right? And so some people said health. You know, hey, I got a, f a loved one or a family member that's sick, and I wish that they would be healthy. Or one person even said, hey, I wish all of our medical bills could just be gone because of the overwhelming feeling, right? That would make my, per my Christmas absolutely perfect. What would it take to make yours perfect? What is the perfect Christmas? We kind of have it up there in our minds, and we have a bunch of images. One of the most common answers, and many people shared, uh, was faith. Right? In church. They said, I want to be at church on Christmas celebrating the birth of Jesus. And, and some even mentioned the candlelight service here at Grace at 11 o'clock. And they like to usher in Christmas morning at church because it's a celebration of Jesus' birth. Which is also a reminder that we do have Christmas Eve services in two weeks. And the times are completely different than a normal Sunday. So make sure you're checking that card. We have three identical traditional services at 10, 4, and 6 
and three identical contemporary at 10, 6, and 11. So make sure you check the schedule. You get here, bring some people with you because faith is a huge element. It's the reason of the season, right? But there was one answer online, just being truthful, that trumped them all, where people said this is the most important part of Christmas, family, right? Being around the people that we love. Family was by far the biggest ingredient for people to have the perfect Christmas. One guy who was serving active in the military even just wrote, home. I just want to be home for Christmas, right? To be with and to be next to the people that I love. That's what would make it an absolutely perfect Christmas. And so whatever it is for you that builds the expectation, what happens when it's not perfect, when it doesn't go how you want it to go. That's what we're talking about today. We're in a series called It's Not About Me Christmas. And today we're going to look at what happens when it's not perfect by our standards. And we're going to go all the way back to just before the very first Christmas. So open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. We're going to be in Luke chapter 1 starting at verse 26 and go all the way through 38. We all have a dream or an image of the perfect Christmas. Maybe it's that, you know, we would have the perfect Christmas cookies in an immaculately cleaned kitchen. And, or maybe it's just that our children would get along and there would be harmony in the home. Or that they would stay healthy throughout the entire Christmas break. Or that the lines wouldn't be too long. And the gifts that we get would be appreciated by people. Or just bottom line... The perfect Christmas really is for us, our standards and our culture and our expectation, when we can make the memories we want to make with the people we want to make them with. That's what Christmas has turned into. But what happens when you wake up from that dream and the reality is a little different? What happens when the reality is that there are long lines at the store? There are traffic jams in Worcester, Ohio at certain times of the weekend, right? Or what happens when your kids do get sick or they do fight? What happens when the gifts that you buy aren't appreciated? What happens, dare I say, sometimes Christmas stinks? What happens when it hurts? When the one that you want to be home can't be home. Maybe there's grief in your soul because of a loved one that's lost. Maybe this is your first Christmas without a sibling or a parent or a child. And you're like, man, I want to have Christmas joy, but let me tell you something. This is nowhere near. We are far from perfect because I can't have the thing that I want this Christmas. It's not perfect anymore. What do you do when your perfect Christmas dream collides with the present Christmas reality? How do you respond to that? What happens when your Christmas is an absolute mess? And for some of you, I know it is. It's an absolute mess. Well, I have some hope for you today. Because if you go all the way back just before the very first Christmas, you're going to discover that it wasn't perfect by our standards. As a matter of fact, we would really call it far from perfect. But if today we were just to pause and we were to examine and we were to reflect on what happened in this Christmas story from the Bible, we will see that God is setting up the birth of his son through a not-so-perfect experience that will turn our expectations upside down and help us have a not about me Christmas and embrace the mess that we see around us. So frankly, in the Christmas story, Mary, the mother of Jesus, man, it's about to be a complete mess for her. And so we pick up the story in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, verse 26, where an angel appears to Mary. Uh, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pled to be mar- pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, now now don't miss this because this is amazing. I mean, if an angel appeared to one of you today and said something, you'd want to tell me about it. And so this is an interruption of her life. An angel appears to a young 13, 14-year-old girl and says, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Oh, well, that's good news. No, she's terrified by this. She's troubled at his words. 
She wonders what kind of a greeting it might be, but the angel said to her, hey, listen, do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You'll conceive and give birth to a son, and you're to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. How how could this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Mary responds and says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. And so just before... Luke tells us about the birth of Christ. He tells us about an interaction between Mary and an angel. And this is a total interruption of her life, and actually it creates a pretty big mess in her world. Now, when we think of this story that's about to happen in Luke chapter 2, we think of a nativity scene like this, right? Where they're handcrafted wood pieces, they're all beautiful, and they're, they're, they're well painted and designed, and the animals stay still. I can't even get my dog to sit, and this thing sits well, you know? And, and so the, the, the Joseph is here, and, the, and Mary's here holding the baby, and it's just absolutely perfect. But it's fake. They're fake. This wasn't a perfect scene. Think of what it would have been like for Mary. She's being told by an angel that she's going to be a 13 or 14 year old unwed teenage mom. In her culture, she could have been killed for that. Not perfect at all. And then you go on and you read the story of the birth of Christ, and you think of how inconvenient it was. Uh, Well, hey, there's this inconveniently timed census that they have to go back to Joseph's hometown to be counted. In the middle of her pregnancy, totally puts her at risk. They go there, they get there, and there's no place for them to stay because everybody booked hotels ahead of time. No place for them. And then she gives birth to the baby. In a rather unsterile environment, they wrap him up in dirty rags and put him in a feeding trough for animals. And then, even though the angel said to her, hey, your baby's the son of God, he's going to be worshipped and he's going to reign forever and ever, the first people that come and worship him are the lowest people in society, the shepherds. And for the first couple of years of this child's life, they're running for their lives, because somebody's always trying to kill them. This is a far from perfect story from our standards. We would look at the first Christmas and go, what an absolute mess that situation is in. But what if I were to tell you that that Christmas, although far from perfect in our standards, was perfect from God's perspective. That's exactly how he wanted to enter the world. So here's the reality this morning. God steps into the middle of a mess, and he brings with him a message of hope. That's how he announced the birth of his son. He was willing to step into the middle of a mess and deliver a message of hope. And so what if... This Christmas, and it's not so perfect reality, you know, where the kids are a little rambunctious and, you know, uh, the, the pain and grief is still there from losing loved ones and the expectations that you set aren't being met and the gifts aren't as good as you thought. And what if all of that was the perfect place for God to redeem this season in your life for you? 
maybe, maybe you do feel like your Christmas is a mess, and maybe it's bigger than that. You feel like your whole life is a mess, or maybe it's just an aspect of your life. Perhaps it's a divorce, or maybe it's a fight with a loved one, or a friend, or a coworker, or an illness that you're struggling with, or a financial crisis that you're battling, or bottom line, a job, whatever. It's just absolutely a mess. Right now, you can't make heads or tails of it. Can you imagine today, whatever it is that's creating the mess in your world, that God can step right into the middle of it with a message of hope? And he can use whatever you think is a mess, whatever you think is not perfect, and he can use it for his glory and for your good. He can do that. To get there, I think we're going to have to learn from Mary in the story today. We're going to have to learn to, to let go of the all-about-me mentality and embrace the not-about-me attitude. And then we'll see that the story of the first Christmas is a whole lot bigger than Mary. And the story of our Christmas is a whole lot bigger than us. It's a story of hope to the world through this baby born. And so from the conversation that Mary has with this angel, I think we are remind, given three key reminders about Christmas, especially when it's a mess, especially when our life is a mess. And if you're a note taker, I'd encourage you to write these down. Here's the first reminder. The reminder of God's promise, of God's promise. God has made a promise to all of us that he will keep. Now, one of the major gifts that our kids have liked getting throughout the years, especially at Christmas, are Legos. And so uh, our middle child, he's a big Lego guy, and, and he enjoys going into the store. And if he has a little bit of money in his pocket and it's burning a hole in there, he has to buy something. And it can be painstakingly difficult for him to decide, right? And so you go through all these different options of Legos, and you look at all the different boxes. And all the boxes, they, they give a picture of the perfect setting, right? And, and so you go through them, and he, and he gets it down to like five or ten and then you have to get it down to two or three and then finally down to one and he buys it. And so he buys it based upon the picture on the box saying, you know what, this is the image that I want to have. This is the promise. And then we go home and he opens up the box and he takes the Legos out and he puts them in the, on, the, on the table in a pile. And it's just a big mess in the middle of the table. And then he gets frustrated because he can't figure out why, how this pile of pieces is supposed to turn into this picture of promise. He picks up the pieces and he's like, Dad, what could this piece possibly do? He doesn't understand how it might fit the picture and how it might serve a purpose. But all by itself, it's kind of pointless and it's frustrating. This piece doesn't work on its own. And for some of you right now, your life feels like a pile of pieces. And you would pick up one piece and you would say, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this situation in my life. And I don't even know what God could do with this situation in my life. Just a pile of pieces. And it distracts you from the picture of promise. It's okay, it's a human way to respond because in verse 29 in our story, when the angel appeared to Mary, it says that she was troubled. She was literally agitated at this, like, whoa, wait, what? And then the angel gives her this promise. He says, you'll conceive, you'll give birth to a son, and you're to call him Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. That's a big promise. For a young teenage girl whose life is about to be turned into a mess, this is a promise that's for her, but a whole lot more than that. It's a promise that Jesus will reign and he will rule, that he wins. God wins and nothing can stop his plan. That's his promise to you. His promise is that his plan works. Even when you think it's a mess, his plan works. When it feels like it's nothing more than a pile of pieces, uh, the promised picture is so far away. But listen, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. 
And he has a plan for how to put those pieces together. There's instructions with it. And the instructions that he gives us are right here in the Bible. These are filled with his promises. And he says, hey, listen, I can take this pile of pieces and turn them into this picture of promise if you will go by this book, the instruction manual. I've given you the promises. The promises like I'll never leave you and forsake you. The promise is that he's going to transform us to look more and more like Jesus. And so the angel tells Mary, there's a promise. Jesus is going to rule. He's going to reign over the whole world. But does he have that kind of authority in your heart? Does Jesus have that kind of authority in your heart? Because he's made a promise. Have you given him control and leadership of your life? He needs that control and leadership to transform you into his son. That's the promise he's given. First reminder is his promise. The second reminder is his presence. His presence. Mary, when she hears this message and this promise, she still isn't quite sure. Like maybe you would be this morning if you walked in and you're like, hey, my life is in a complete mess right here. My Christmas is a mess, and I hear what you're saying, man, but let me tell you something. I'm not so sure yet. She's not very sure either. I mean, when your life is in pieces and you see the promise, you kind of want to know how. How is this really going to work? And that's what Mary asks. Look at verse 34. How could this be? I'm a virgin. How could this be that I'm going to have a baby? And all of us can be guilty of this. When we're told something that's brand new, it's a new idea or something challenging to the way we're living, we tend to how it to death instead of wowing it to life. After all, this is an angel she's talking to. And instead of having a faith-filled response, she kind of gives a skeptic doubt. And you got to give her some, some latitude here, don't you? I mean, she's a young woman who's a virgin, and so she's like, hey, Mr. Angel Man, thanks for coming. You see, but there's a problem. I can't have a baby because I've never had sex. How are you going to do that? Well, the angel's not deterred. He provides Mary with the who instead of the how. Look what the angel says. The Holy Spirit is going to come on you. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God. And his presence is significance. See, when we take the Legos to our house and we put the pile of pieces on the table, and we're trying to get it to look like this picture on the box, it can be frustrating even if we follow the directions, because sometimes the directions are a little confusing, or sometimes the directions just don't make sense to us, or sometimes we're reading the directions wrong. We never like to admit that, but sometimes we are reading the directions wrong. And so my son, I let him kind of figure it out, but eventually he might say, Dad, I need some help here. And so when I come over and I sit there and I kind of help him go through a step or two of the instructions, he gets encouraged because my presence carries some power with it just being there and helping him out. Your presence matters in people's lives. The presence of God is a difference maker in our life. The angel says to Mary, hey, listen, the Spirit of God is the gift of God's presence that's going to be with you. You're not going to walk through whatever this mess is in your life. You're not going to walk through it alone. The psalmist reminds us in Psalm 23 that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God's presence brings something with it. It brings a rod of correction, which is important because sometimes our thinking and our lives are going the wrong way. And he reconnects us or recorrects our course. But he also has a staff of comfort and care. Whatever the mess is in your world... God's correction and his care and his comfort is available through his spirit. He is with you. And so maybe if you, as you look at the pile of pieces this Christmas, you would say, rather than thinking, how can this ever make sense again? 
you would maybe ask, who can make sense of this for me? Who can I trust to put this back together? Who can I trust to make a masterpiece out of the mess? The angel told Mary, the Spirit of God. That's who's going to get it done. Aren't you glad that God is not a God who just provides a picture on a box, a promise of a perfect scenario, and then walks away and says, good luck? No, he offers his presence. He's with us, helping us use the instructions, because the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to make us look more like the Son of God. Second reminder, God's presence. Final reminder in this conversation is God's power. So we have his promise, we have his presence, and then finally, we see his power. I was reminded of this power on Monday. It's my day off, and I was just hanging out in the kitchen for a little bit, and some Christmas music was on in the speaker, and my daughter was with me. She's four years old, and she really likes to sing a lot. And so she was singing Christmas carols, and we were kind of giggling and having a good time. And then the song, Mary Did You Know, came on. And so she started singing it, and it went through a chorus or two or whatever. And then finally, I noticed that she stopped singing it, and the song kept going on. And eventually, I kind of stopped what I was doing, and I looked at her, and she had this very perplexed and puzzled look on her face. And she was staring right at the, at the speaker, and she finally just said, Mary, why don't you know? And I'm like, okay, fair enough, right? Well, what's that song about? How could Mary have known that in the middle of this mess that she was going to actually carry Jesus, who is the message of hope, that this baby would have the power to do some amazing things like walking on water, like uh, making a guy that was blind be able to see, a guy that was deaf be able to hear, making people new. He, st- he calmed a storm with one hand. He made Lazarus come back to life when he was dead. That's the kind of power she was carrying. How crazy is it that she had the baby who would display the power of God to the world? But you wouldn't know it if you were trying to find perfect. Because that is far from perfect. But what she was carrying was perfect. It didn't look all that Pinteresty. It didn't look all that cute. But it was real. And the baby Jesus that she gave birth to is a game changer, a difference maker, a life transformer. And that baby that was born in a manger grew to be a man who died on a cross. And through that death, a sacrificial death, he paid the price for our sin because all of us have blown it. We're guilty. We've messed up. We've offended God. We haven't lived according to the standard of the Bible, his word. And because of that, we're cut off from his presence. And the Bible tells us that because of that, all of us are spiritually dead in our sins. And yet, because of Jesus' death on our behalf on the cross, he gives us access to the power that brings us to life. He makes dead things come back to life. That's the kind of power that Mary was carrying. That's the kind of power that's available to you this Christmas. That's what makes it a not about me Christmas. That's what turns it upside down. That's what turns the mess into a masterpiece. Not you, him. He's the one that has the power. See, when life is a mess, and it's nothing more than a pile of pieces... He doesn't just offer the picture of perfect on the box. He doesn't just offer his presence that's there to to kind of go, well, hey, you know, good luck. I'll be here with you, but I can't help you. No, he's a God that offers power that can take that pile of pieces and turn it into something that's a finished product. No, it might not look how you wish it would look. That doesn't mean that you're going to get your loved one back if they've died. It doesn't mean that, you know, everything's going to go the way you think it should. It doesn't mean that everything's going to go the way I think it should. That's not what this is about. But it is about the fact that he can still bring a masterpiece out of this mess. He can still bring glory out of this mess. He can still work for your good in the mess. 
That's what he told Mary, the angel. He says, the Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High, I love this part, will overshadow you. Some of you, the mess is so big and the situation is so overwhelming to you. That's all you can think about. That's all you can talk about. And it's all that you can point to. Look at this mess. Look at this mess. Look at this mess. Look at this mess. I'd have to imagine. We can only imagine because it doesn't say that Mary kind of had to feel like that. Are you kidding me? Look at the mess. Yet the angel says the power of the Most High will cover that. That God's, I believe somebody here needs to hear this word, that God's power, his ability, his influence, and his strength is available to you through Christ. It covers you. It overshadows your circumstances. God's power is stronger than your situation. It doesn't mean you get it all back and you get what you want, but it means he gets the glory and you are treated good. He can make a masterpiece out of your mess. He has the power to make a product from a pile of pieces. Pieces that don't make much sense on their own. But when you put them all together, and he changes it, you can blow your mind. I love in verse 37, the angel reminds us that no word that God has promised will ever, ever fail. No word. When God speaks it, it's good. And so maybe this Christmas, it's all about giving up the the dream a little bit. We all have those images of what would make Christmas perfect. What if we let go of the perfect Christmas dream and we embrace the, the present Christmas reality, whatever it is, And we embrace it and we say, okay, God, I'm not going to how this because I want to see everything and how it's going to work. I'm not going to try to fix it myself. I'm not going to try to cope and cover it up like it's not there. I'm going to trust and give it to you. You know, that's exactly what Mary did. And every time I read this story, this last verse for, that we're going to focus on today, it always just catches my heart. A young, unwed teenage mom has her life completely turned upside down by the promise of this king that will rule the world one day later, but she's going to have to go through a whole lot of yuck to get there. And look what she says. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left. Now I know that this is a lot easier said than done. But it should serve as an inspiration to us of how to respond. You talk about a a statement of complete surrender. Her life's a total mess, but her response is a total trust. Mary trusted the messenger of God that gave her the hope in the middle of that mess. And that's what makes Christmas perfect. That in the middle of your mess can come a message of hope through Christ. That is the perfect Christmas. That's the Christmas that's perfect from God's eyes. If you want to have the perfect Christmas, it's finding the hope in the middle of the mess. So I want to invite you to do that right here today. Would you do me a favor? And everyone was handed when they walked in a program, and inside there was a red card like this. Would you just find that card real quick, pull it out? And then if you wouldn't mind just bowing your head closing your eyes, and just opening your heart up to God today. You can open it up to him real big. Maybe today you need to surrender your life to God. 
you know, really everyone's life is a total mess because of sin. A definition of sin is to miss the mark. God has a standard, it's perfection, and no one has hit it. You're in good company here today because everyone that's listening to this message is a sinner. And that makes our lives a mess. And it's right in the middle of that mess and that chaos that God steps in through his son. The reason that we celebrate Christmas, God with us, Emmanuel, is because the message of hope has arrived. The good news. The bad news is you're a sinner. The good news is there's a Savior. And God's son is a gift to all of us because of what he came to do. He came to die. And his death in your place paid the price for your sin and mine. And when we trust in that work for us, it turns our life from being all about us to all about him. And so maybe you could respond to that offer, to that invitation that he gives to you, just like Mary didn't say, I'm the Lord's servant. I'm here. Have my life. You can talk to him right here, silently in your heart. Every head bowed and eye closed, but you can talk to God. Just quietly in your heart, say to him, I know I've sinned, I know I've blown it. Admit it to him. Thank him for Jesus and what he did on the cross for you. And then surrender control to him. Say, you be the leader of my life. If you just had that conversation with God, let me tell you, there is a promise that he's going to make you like Jesus, his son. And that his presence is now with you in the form of his spirit. And he's going to transform you from the inside out, day after day after day. And he has the power to do it. And it's going to blow your mind what he can do in your life. And if you just had that conversation, you know, Grace Church exists to help all people take their next steps in following Christ. That's why we're here. And so we want to know that you've taken that step. And as I asked you to find that red card, if you wouldn't mind on the bottom where it says, my next step, if you just had that conversation with God, just write Jesus down. Say, I just had that conversation with him. And the reason you do that is to let us know so we can connect with you and encourage you. It's the best decision you'll ever make. It's how he brings a masterpiece out of a mess. I know many of you in here have already made that decision. So perhaps you need to be reminded of his leadership in your life. Maybe there's some places in your world where it's the all about me instead of I am the Lord's servant. Man, what a tremendous response and heart. Mary was willing to embrace the mess in order to experience the miracle. Uh, we can do the same thing this Christmas. When we sacrificially give above and beyond in the greatest gift Christmas offering, it is going to help people who are in an absolute mess. Rescuing at-risk children in Southeast Asia who are in a mess, but because of the message of hope, have a chance. Or maybe you say, I'm the Lord's servant. I want to serve somebody today. You can be a part of that Give Joy campaign where we're trying to connect with 10,000 people in our community. What if today everyone listening to this message would, as soon as the message is over and the service is finished, you would leave here and you would go and give joy to someone intentionally. Thousands of people could be influenced today by a simple act of kindness. And Mary carried the message of hope with her, just like we who follow Christ carry the message of hope. And we need to be inviting people to find that hope. You have that invitation to Christmas Eve in your worship program to be giving out, to be inviting people to join you so they can find what Christmas is really all about. God, I pray that you would make our Christmas not about us. 
God, thank you for every person in this room. God, I know there are people here today whose Christmas and life is an absolute mess. They feel like it's a pile of pieces. God, would your spirit meet them where they are right now? Will you draw them to yourself? Will you do a work in their life that can only be described as your power, your presence, and your promise? God, thank you that when we feel like it's a bunch of pieces, you walk in. You step into the mess with a message of hope. Thank you for Christ and for Christmas and for eternal hope. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I hope you are inspired and encouraged by what you've experienced here today. At Grace Church, we believe that there's always a next step, and I trust that God is beginning to reveal your next step to you now. If that's the case, would you share that with us? You can do that on the response card right on the Grace Church app. We would love to pray with you and help you take that next step. Well, thanks again for choosing to connect with us online, and have a great day.